Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Is that all okay? Yep. All right. I'll, I'll take my mask off. That might be a bit better as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so hi, I'm Gemma from Durham University, and I'm going to tell you about uh, a method we've developed uh, by using copies to improve precision for continuous time quantum computing. And we've also recently uh, got a paper up on archive, so if you want to read more about it, then that's the link up there. So, uh, but before I tell you about uh, how we improve the precision, uh, I need to tell you about why we need to improve precision. So what, what it essentially boils down to is a problem of expectation versus reality. You see, when, when a theorist comes along, they'll have the expectation of wanting to solve an optimization problem. And these, uh, an optimization problem is a problem where the solution is encoded in the minimum energy state or the ground state of this particular problem. And they come in various shapes and sizes, but what we like to do is represent them on Ising models. And what you see here is a simplistic, uh, very simplistic Ising model. So we have two qubits here. Uh, each of these qubits have a field applied to them, and they're connected via this coupling strength here. And to access the energy levels of this Ising model, we can write down the Hamiltonian, which will look something like this. And as our optimization problem uh, becomes more and more complicated, we might find that the fields and the couplings that we want to have on our Ising model become more and more specific. And unfortunately, this is where reality may have to step in. Because when we try and represent our, problem, our optimization problem on a quantum computer, then we're then limited by the resolution of the fields and the couplings that we can actually set on this quantum computer. Uh, the upshot of which is that if we're trying to represent this um, field like this, what we may en actually end up uh, setting is something close to this. And this is not ideal at all because essentially every time you're changing the fields and the couplings, you're shifting around the energy levels. If this happens enough, you may change the actual ground state of your problem. So when you do something like your quantum annealing to find the ground state, you'll end up getting a completely different uh, answer to your optimization problem than, than you want. So how do we go about uh, stopping finding the wrong answer? Well, a, a naive approach might be that if you get the wrong answer the first time, you could simply just try again, and then you might get the right answer a second time. But we want to do better than this. So, uh, following on from an idea we first found in this paper here and actually was presented at AQC 2019, we start off by connecting two copies of our Ising model together. This is where our technique starts to diverge because instead of connecting these two copies ferromagnetically, we connect them antiferromagnetically so that the spins on either side of these, this antiferromagnetic link want to oppose each other. We also set the strength of our antiferromagnetic links to be uh, the minimum allowed value by the resolution of our quantum computer. We also treat, still treat these two individual copies as sep almost as separate copies, uh, as in if we're finding the ground state, we only need one or more of these copies to be correct for us to consider the computation a success. On top of this, we add a, thir a further third copy and connect it in this triangular configuration. Um, and the idea behind this is that it helps uh, prevent error propagation between the copies. So how did we test how our te technique worked? Well, first off, we swapped out this too simplistic two-qubit Ising model for more difficult to solve Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glasses, which were also studied by other members of our group um, in continuous time techniques in this paper here. And so we, used, we went from five qubits to nine qubits spin glasses, 
And I haven't drawn in the H's and the J's here, but we still have um, random fields and couplings on each of the qubits, and these black lines represent the couplings. And they, these uh, fields and couplings can be uh, randomly drawn from the interval minus one to plus one. Next, what we do is we uh, generate 10,000 of these Sherrington Kirkpatrick swing glasses. We then subject them to a lack of resolution. That is, the, we define a number of allowed values between minus one and plus one, and that the fields and couplings have to round to. And these number of values are defined by two to the p plus one, where p we call the precision. We then vary this precision from one to 10. So the idea behind that is, um, as you're increasing the precision, you're getting closer to the optimization problem that you actually want to represent. And so once, once we've applied the lack of resolution, we next measured something we called fraction correct for the singular instances. Uh, that is the fraction of times when finding the ground state, um, sorry, when, yeah, the fraction of times once subjected to a lack of resolution that we still found the correct ground state. And just to note that we found the, in this case, we in these all these cases, we found the ground state using a classical branch and bound technique. Uh, once we've done this for the singular instances, we then did this again for our free antiferromagnetically connected copies, uh, finding the fraction correct, remembering that we only need one or more of these copies to be correct in order for us to consider the computation a success and therefore let it add to our fraction correct. We could then also measure the breakdown of fraction correct, i.e. the fraction of times we had three copies correct, two copies correct, or even just one copy correct. We then could plot this versus the precision. And this is what you see here. So on the left-hand bars, you see the results from our singular disconnected instances. And you can see that as the precision increases, we find that the fraction correct also increases. This is as we would expect, because as the precision is increasing, we're getting closer to the optimization problem that we want to represent. And on the right-hand bars, you see the results from our three, three antiferromagnetically connected copies. And you can also see that as the precision increases, we see an improvement in fraction correct. But what's interesting to us is that between just having the singular copies and the three connected copies, we see an improvement in fraction correct, indicating that our, our, our technique is, is uh, working. And what we can also see is that the a lot of the improvement from our technique is coming from those instances which have either two or one copies correct, indicating that the antiferromagnetic uh, links have a part to play in it. We next wanted to look at the effect of our technique on individual instances. So the fraction of times our technique had no effect on the singular instances. The fraction of times our technique had a, had a positive effect i.e. the singular instance was incorrect, but then was made correct by using our technique. And then finally, we wanted to see what fraction of instances our technique had a negative effect. So the fraction of times the, the singular instances were correct, but then were made incorrect by using our technique. And what we found is this. So the left-hand bars again show just the fraction correct from the singular instances as on the previous plot. But on the right hand bars, we essentially changed how we're, we're breaking up the, the bars. So what we see here is that um, the improvement from our technique, as you might expect, is coming from those instances where our technique is having a positive effect. And happily for us, the number of instances that our technique is having a negative effect on is, is fairly small. It was also pointed out to us that uh, alongside our free connected copies, we could even include this small improvement if we wanted to access the full improvement. Uh, we could have an extra external copy and therefore see when our technique is essentially breaking the singular instances. We can therefore measure from the left-hand bars 
the gap between the left-hand bars to the right-hand bars to show us the improvement between using a singular co a single uh, copy and three connected copies. And this, this was initially just for five qubit spin glasses, but we wanted to see whether this improvement continued for larger spin glasses. And that's what I, I'm showing here. So what you can see is the results from five qubits again, seven qubits, eight qubits, and nine qubits. And the gap uh, between this solid bar, which, solid line, which represents the singular, the results fraction correct from the singular instances, and the, and the dotted line, which represents the results from the three connected copies, indicates that there continues to be an improvement by using our method uh, up to at least nine qubit spin glasses. We next wanted to quantify this improvement in terms of a uh, gain of precision. So we, if you can essentially think about this as kind of trying to measure horizontally across from your uh, single, uh, sorry, free qubit, free connected uh, copy results to your single copy results to sort of tell at what precision you would need to be at for a single copy in order to get the same results uh, via free copies. And so to do this numerically, what we did is we essentially plotted one, one minus the fraction correct instead of, um, yeah, and so just essentially just flipped the, flipped the axes around and, and plotted an exponential plot to our, extrapolated the data and plot an exponential plot to our single instance data, and then we could essentially measure across the distance between the free copy data and the single copy data, and then we could plot this versus the precision to get a graph which looks like this. And what we can see here is that as, at least from uh, P equals two uh, and higher, we can see that as the precision increases, the precision in improvement also increases to around about three bits, a gain of three bits of precision at around six or seven, uh, P equals six or seven. So this indicates that there is an uh, improvement in precision that can be gained by using our technique. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that by connecting three copies of spin glasses with antiferromagnetic links of a minimum strength, we have made our, our problem more robust to a lack of precision and that we could use this to increase the effective precision of our computations. And if you would like to uh, know more details about it, then we have a paper recently up on archive, and I'm also happy to answer any questions, and thank you for listening. I have a question. Okay. No. Um, uh, thank you. That was a, that was an interesting talk. I'm I'm wondering uh, about embedding large three copies of large cliques in such a way that they can all be connected. Uh, I know you you know on the Pegasus graph there are these parallel qubits, the paired qubits, and I can see how you could get two embeddings in there pretty easily. But I'm wondering about three embeddings and how difficult is that, and, and does it mess up your chain links and questions like that? So. At least at the time that we started doing this, um, there was we were not the we didn't think that uh, connections with triangles would be possible on something like a D wave. But I think since the, the Pegasus graph has now got some triangles, which which mm -hmm. means it can be possible. There's also another issue with embedding in that we think that embedding is likely to kind of have a negative effect on just just even without the even without, um, even without our using our method, it will have a negative effect on just the um, the the fraction correct essentially of just singular instances. So that could potentially n not be helpful. Yeah, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, I, I did have another question. Um, uh, it, do you have an, an an explanation for why antiferromagnetic couplings might be better than ferromagnetic couplings in this in this scenario? So, so our initial idea was that it was it was helping prevent error propagation. Um, yeah, we're not sure because 
uh, what we do now is is essentially it's like a it's not random, so it's a deterministic effect. So when we're doing when we're setting our lack of resolution, it's deterministic rather than random. So um, uh, I've lost my thread a little bit there, uh, but. Um, uh, um, what I was trying to say. We we could follow up afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Sure. No worries. I'm uh, a little bit confused about the comparison between. Uh, uh, embedding of uh, three copies and having just one copy because if uh, you are embedding three copies, you are definitely uh, spending much more resources than you would need for one copy, right? And it's like it's probably even more than by a factor of three because you have some embedding overhead. Yes. So, but um, so I have done with, at least with this. Um, these bars are essentially equivalent to uh, three copies, uh, sorry, one copy three times. But you can't really, because of the way we've done our problem now, uh, because it's a deterministic error rather than random errors, there's kind of no improvement from repeating. So you can't, you essentially can't see the difference that, that, that it makes. Where before we had a lot of degeneracy in the way we did it and you could see the, the increase in improvement that uh, doing extra uh, runs did, but you, you can't see it now, unfortunately. But it, we get a more improvement by using this technique, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, what I'm trying to say is this is, this is effectively the same, okay, minus the possible uh, resources from embedding, I guess, but this is the same as running three copies of the single instance. Uh, can you again show how did you do the simulation? Like, oh, okay, uh, yeah. So, so this was how we did it. But yeah, so I've uh, yeah. So we defined a number of values between minus one and plus one, and the, the but these values were so we, so these values were randomly generated to be, so within within bounds where we set the bounds that were like uh, minimum, okay. Yeah, I'm basically asking if you are computing the ground state uh, or doing something else. Uh, yeah, we're finding the ground state. No dynamics, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. There's another question. So in, in the work that we did on uh, the quantum yield correction with ferromagnetic as opposed to anti-ferromagnetic yeah. coupling, uh, the logic of using ferromagnetic is that um, you are forcing all these qubits to agree. Uh, you don't create any frustration. Yeah. And in this setting, you, you're actually introducing a, a lot of extra frustration that wasn't there in the original problem, yes. which um, seems like could be problematic. So I, I guess I'm repeating uh, Kathy's question. Why, why, why do you want to do that as opposed to ferromagnetic? So we're also, so as, as well as using the anti-ferromagnetic links, so uh, from, from QAC, you were kind of enforcing that all three of the copies, or so you, you use more than that, but uh, all, all of the copies within the, within the system needed to be correct. So it's more, it was more of an error correction code. Whereas this, we're allowing copies to be incorrect. So, because basically by doing that, we're kind of, by allowing one copy to be correct, it, it's almost helping the other copy remain correct. Yeah, I see, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting idea. But is, it, is that intuition or is that proven? So there was similar work using temperature to, to you know,
perform error correction against small errors. So this is, I think, a similar idea where you're saying, okay, what are similar optimal solutions or similar near optimal solutions that are sort of nearby? And I think that would be the intuition I would have is that this is similar to turning on a low finite temperature, but you're doing it by adding couplings rather than explicitly adding a temperature. I also like had some intuition about why this antiferromagnetic might be better than ferromagnetic. So what I'm thinking is that say, uh, say you just have this uh, two qubit problem, and uh, and one of the we just consider one control error where uh, like the the problem has it such that uh, qubit one so the lower qubit uh, the, the qubit on the left uh, is. Uh, is supposed to be down, downwards, but uh, we had some control errors such that the, the local field on the qubit is too high and, and, it, and it becomes uh, upwards. And now when you have uh, ferromagnetic connections with other copies, this uh, error will, propag will propagate and reinforce each other. But uh, when, when, when you have antiferromagnetic, uh, this uh, frustration kind of stops this error from propagating and reinforce uh, each other. I understand it, yeah. Okay, I guess there is something to discuss. <laughs> I understand. Uh, okay, so let's uh, thank uh, Gemma again. And this is uh, the end of today's uh,